everybody. Roger says hey. So we're tackling another space video today. I warned you guys that we're going to be doing more videos on space stuff because I really enjoy it. There's a lot to learn when it comes to that topic. So last week we took a look at the top space agencies in the world other than NASA. And the week before that we watched a video called the Nazis in Space. And it talked about the German V2 rocket that was developed during World War II and unfortunately used to bomb a lot of cities in Europe. And one of the scientists behind that rocket was Warner von Braun. And I've wanted to learn a little bit more about him, especially since he did come over here to the United States and work with NASA. So that's actually what this video is going to be about today. Now, I don't really know much about Wander von Braun. I feel like he's one of those controversial historical figures where because he worked with the Nazis, just everything about him is villainized and America is villainized because they worked with him. But I don't know if it's as simple as that. That's why I really want to watch a lot of these videos is to try and better understand all of that. So anyway, I'm curious about how all of this went down. So let's take a look at the uh, the rockets behind the moon landing. November 1961. NASA pilots test the X-15 rocket plane. Prepare to go. Launch. I haven't seen this before. Speeding to Mach 6, NASA reaches out for the edge of space. At 12 6, still good. Right there, but unbeknown to the American public, these rocketry milestones have been built on technology from an unlikely source. The V2, right? It's kind of what the V2 was, right? 1940. World War II rages as London burns under relentless aerial bombardment. But deep within Nazi Germany, Hitler's plans for a new long-range superweapon are being hatched. The V-2 rocket is the world's first ballistic missile and will leave Britain defenseless. But the V-2 has come at great cost to the Nazi war effort. This explosion's crazy. <laughs> However, these early lessons in rocketry will mark the surprising first steps towards manned spaceflight. And the mastermind behind the V-2 rocket, scientist Werner von Braun, will later become an unlikely giant of the American space program. At the end of the war, US agents capture over 100 German scientists, including von Braun and recruit them to develop weapons for the US Army. The story of von Braun's arrival in the States dates back much further than that. It was very clear that the Allies were winning the war. They had to decide who they should surrender to. They were too concerned about the treatment that they would get from the Russians. And that left the United States Von Braun and his team were shipped over to the States in September 1945, along with 15 tons of paperwork and more than 100 V-2 rockets. What? On arrival in America... So, so 100 V-2 rockets came over here to the States? Okay. I guess all of the scientific paperwork as well. Hmm. I wonder if it wasn't just the Germans' decision to surrender to the States. I wonder if the, the States knew they could possibly go to the Soviet Union and be used for the same thing over there with the scientific research and stuff. And so part of the strategy of the states bringing them over here was to uh, keep them out of Russian hands, basically. So it was a tactical move against Russia for the United States as much as anything else. That would make sense. Von Braun continues to develop the V-2 rocket for the US Army, working on the rockets captured from Nazi Germany. Von Braun and his team were clearly interested in pushing the technology forwards improving the performance of the V2, refining some of the systems that control the flight. Eventually, they started flying two-stage rockets where the V2 was the first stage and they had an additional booster as the second stage. With this small young missile called the WAC Corporal, fresh out of Pasadena, California, the V2 WAC Corporal combination marked for the first time the blending in action of American and German rocket brains. 
a combination that was destined to have its rendezvous with history. As the Cold War gathers momentum, both superpowers realize the conflict will be won or lost on the power of technology. <laughs> wow. With missiles reaching higher and higher altitudes, it becomes clear that the ultimate symbol of superiority will be the conquest of space. The space race was essentially an arms race, but rather than using weapons of war, it was about the development of space technology. This battle between two competing superpowers, communism, capitalism, the United States and the Soviet Union, and what better stage could there be for you to convince the rest of the world that your system was superior than the stage of space exploration? I mean, if you're gonna fight a war, you might as well do it by trying to get to space first. Like, that's, that is, uh, that's almost like a positive thing, you know? Like, so that's the way I view it. I know some people don't think that money spent on space uh, exploration is money well spent. I think that it's almost necessary because it gives humans something beyond just Earth to, to reach for. I think there there's something really important in exploring something, again, that is, that is a larger than yourself and larger than this little bubble that you live in. And and I think exploration too is just fundamental to the human experience. I mean, that's I mean, there are all kinds of explorers that went out and explored the world. But yeah, like if you're going to if two superpowers are going to fight with each other, trying to get to space first is the way to go. <laughs> you know? Like nobody really gets hurt except for the poor animals and astronauts that gave their lives, but you know, there's no fighting going on. Supremacy in space was vital. It said to the world, we have the technological superiority over our rivals. And this is why it came as such a shock to the United States when the Russians launched the first artificial satellite to orbit the Earth. All the people on this fast shrinking planet heard about it. Many of them watched it. All of them read about it. In 1957, the U.S. learns of several spectacular Soviet space victories that send shockwaves across America. On October the 4th, 1957, the Soviet Union launches Sputnik 1, the world's first artificial satellite. Sputnik really put the United States into crisis. It was a global event. The Americans were absolutely shocked that a dictatorship suddenly beats them to the first hurdle, which was to put the first object into orbit around the Earth. Every day it was orbiting the Earth 16 times, and every day it was passing over American territory. There was nothing they could do about it, and that's why it had such a powerful effect on their psyche. So like Epic History TV, TV for it there for a second. It's the same music they used for the Napoleonic Wars. In desperation, the United States looked to the vanguard. Nearly 200 newsmen from all over the world were flown down for the big turkey shoot. And inside the blockhouse, the tension steadily mounted. had never been lower than at this moment, December 6, 1957. As people were basking in the awe over Sputnik, this was called Flopnik, because of course it got nowhere. It was at that point the American army with Werner von Braun were unleashed to launch a satellite within 60 days. And von Braun and his army team launched the first American satellite on the 31st of January, 1958. In 1958, 
Washington forms a research organization to accelerate an American space program. NASA is born. Von Braun was enveloped within this expanding NASA organization that hoovered up all of those different departments of Air Force, Army, and civilian activities to create the infrastructure that could mobilize major programs. Von Braun and his men immediately begin work on a heavy lift vehicle that they believe will give America the lead in the space race. Saturn V, right? Having stumbled at every hurdle in the race, there was further humiliation for the United States with the launch of Yuri Gagarin. He was the first human being to orbit the Earth, and that's all he did. One complete orbit, and then lands successfully. I say that's all he did, but we need to remember, of course, that every second he was traveling five miles. And he landed as a global hero. He was fated by the Soviet Union as a triumph of what was possible under a communist society. It really put a lot of pressure on the White House. How could you have let our country fall behind so badly? How could it be possible that the Russians could launch an artificial satellite and then secondly launch um, a human being? So the Americans felt this very, very deeply indeed. Kennedy said at the time, we're going to have to take more hits before we pull ahead. And that was the view, simply head down, focus, keep going. One month later, the United States responds with Project Mercury and launches astronaut Alan Shepard to become America's first man in space. To your attention, please. On low mark, T minus 15 minutes. T minus 15 minutes and counting. Status check, pressurization. Locks taking, you are go. Water systems, go. Range operations. Mercury capsule, go. All pre-start panel lights are correct. The ready light is on. Eject Mercury umbilical. Oil evacuate. Mercury umbilical clear. Lights on. All recorders to fast. T minus eight seconds and counting engine start. Bolts and lift off. All right, uh, lift off and the clock has started. This is Freedom 7, reading you loud and clear. Control is smooth. What a beautiful view. <clears throat> I thought John Glenn was the first astronaut, American astronaut to orbit Earth. So I'm, I can't remember if Alan Shepard orbited or if he just made it up to a certain altitude and then came back down. That, uh, that picture they just showed of Earth. I wonder when the, the very first images of Earth from space were made and who made them. I wonder if it was the Russians that did that because that must have been something to, to have that very that very first image of, of Earth looking down on it from space. It must have just been super incredible like that, having that first experience. Although Shepard's flight is a success, President Kennedy believes America must now show the world they can supersede all Soviet achievements. You're President behind. Kennedy begins a tour of four space installations at Huntsville, Alabama, where he is greeted by Dr. Verna von Braun, space pioneer and director of this research and development center. I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the Earth. No single space project in this period will be more impressive to mankind or more important for the long-range exploration of space. And none will be so difficult or expensive to accomplish. Godspeed, John Glenn. Roger, zero G, and I feel fine. Oh, that view is tremendous. Kennedy's pledge will inspire the American people, calm hysteria, and unite an army of engineers to take up his challenge. 
All right, well, I've never done a, this was from the Spark channel and I've never done a video from them before. I wasn't expecting it to be a British uh, sort of documentary or take on it. So that was, that was kind of interesting. So this didn't go as deeply into the relationship between the United States and, you know, the, the Nazi or the German scientists that they brought over here as I would like it to, but there are plenty of other videos I can watch on that to, to learn more. So but what this did do was it did highlight more the um, capitalism versus communism. It emphasized more about how the United States really kind of felt behind in this in the space race, and how important it was for them to take this bold move of saying that we're going to land a person on the moon. It's kind of crazy that launching satellites was like a big deal. <laughs> like I know it had never been done before and to, to think that there's something in space orbiting Earth, you know, I guess back then that would have been, it was unheard of, right? So it would have been this brand new thing that people People have to get used to. For us today is no big deal. Like there are literally hundreds of satellites orbiting Earth, which is crazy to think about. Like how do they not all like run into each other? <laughs> but that was definitely cool. I want to get more into like the story of those German scientists. I think I've seen it referred to as Operation Paperclip and I would like to really learn a lot more about that and that whole story because I really don't know anything about it. And I'm all for like watching more stuff about the space race. I would like to learn more about the Russian side of it as well because I don't really know what was going on in Russia during all of that and wh how they perceive NASA and you know the uh, the American accomplishments in space how they felt about it so that would be a really fascinating look for me as well anyway I hope you guys enjoyed this video make sure to hit the like button if you did and also make sure to subscribe if you haven't done that yet we'll be following this up with a lot more space stuff so if you're interested in that could definitely use your help down in the comments to kind of learn all of this and if you did like this video odds are you might be a Star Trek fan I do have a Star Trek podcast called Tribbles and Transporters. The link to that is in the description and pinned comment if you're interested in checking that out. I also have a Patreon where I do a lot of other videos that I can't do here on YouTube. So if you're interested in seeing what that's all about, the link is also in the description and pinned comment along with all of my social media. My PO Box info is there too if you're looking for that. Anyway, Raja here and I thank you guys for watching as always. Stay tuned for more space stuff coming up on my channel and we'll see you next time.